Well, welcome to another Friday night. We've been working on a series on the deep, a deeper look at the 60 characteristics of complex trauma. In the last two weeks, we've given two tests to help you figure out if you might have complex trauma or complex PTSD. Today, I want to return to one of the characteristics, which is people from complex trauma have experienced many losses. Now, we've done teaching at different times on the subject of grief and losses, so I'm not going to repeat all of that, but I want to kind of come at it from a new angle that I've not really taught on before. But before we do that, let me just start by kind of laying a, a, a background, a, a backdrop to this topic. So there are four ways that we can experience loss in our life. We usually think in terms of people dying when we think of grief and loss. But it goes way beyond that. And so the first type is, yes, we can lose someone. And that can be to death. But it can also be the end of a relationship, the breakup of a family. Or we can lose something, a pet. Those are all losses, and those are things that we can lose that we're never going to get back. And so it's a finality of loss. Then there's a second type. We can lose something or someone, but there's a chance we might get it back. So think of a mother who loses her children to, to the system because she's in addiction. So she's going through loss in losing her children, but she also knows that if she gets her life on track, she can get her kids back. So she's dealing with loss and hope at the same time. And that can happen in relationships where somebody says, I'm done with you unless you clean up. And they walk out of your life and you lose them, but there's a chance you might get them back. But there's also a chance you might not get them back. And, and so that's a type of loss. And then thirdly, in recovery, there are losses where we choose to lose something. We choose to let go of something that's harmful to us. It could be a toxic person. We just have to cut them out of our life. So it's not that they died. It's not that they left us. We had to choose to let them go. It might be members of our family. It might be an activity. It might be a place, an event. All of those things, we just, those aren't good for me. Those take me backwards and, and they don't help me in my growth. So I have to choose to let go and those can be very difficult. But the fourth one and what I want to focus on today are the losses that come from complex trauma. And what I mean by that, and this is kind of a weird thing, there, there are things that we never had, but we should have had. And so we're losing something that we never had but should have had. So a child should have had a loving home, but in complex trauma they didn't have that. And so they're losing something that they should have had, but they didn't have. And what happens as people begin to understand complex trauma is they begin to understand all kinds of things they should have had, but they didn't because of the family they grew up in. And that's what I want to focus on today. And I'm going to give you 42 different losses of things you didn't have, have but should have had. But before I do that, the process of dealing with loss we call grief. And just let me say a couple things about that. So a definition of grief is it's a response to loss. It usually involves emotional pain that is sometimes very strong and even overwhelming. So it's an intense, negative, painful emotion. So like we said, grieving isn't just related to people dying. It can be related to all kinds of different losses. And the more precious or valuable that thing was to you or that person was to you, 
the more difficult the grieving process because the more pain you have to try to resolve in losing that very precious thing. But understand it is a process. And grieving is a universal thing. Everybody experiences losses. It's just people from complex trauma tend to experience more losses than most. But it is a process that takes time. You don't just resolve it overnight or in a week. It can take up to a couple years or even longer to resolve deeply painful losses. And, and it, you go through a process that includes resolving some intense emotions, resolving some intellectual stuff. All of those things are part of a process that takes time and we've done other lectures on that so people from complex trauma are considered at high risk when it comes to loss in other words they're high, at high risk that's going to mess them up more than it would a low risk person so what makes people from complex trauma at high risk so let me give that to you. Again, most have more losses than most due to an unhealthy upbringing. So they ended up in an unhealthy lifestyle where they ex were exposed to more traumatizing situations, where they got into bad relationships, where they experienced suicides, where they had to end relationship after relationship, where they lost children. All of those things come out of the tools given you in childhood to go into life in complex trauma, which set you up to be in situations where you would end up having more losses. Secondly, you weren't given healthy tools for grieving losses in a healthy way. And we're going to look at those tools in a, next week. Um, then, for most people from complex trauma, they never had role models who showed them how to resolve grief in a healthy way. That was a problem. Then the commitment of complex trauma is I don't like pain because pain always re results in getting hurt, which results in more pain. So fight or flight or freeze is the main way of coping. So losses triggers fight, flight, or freeze. They're all about avoiding. And so people can experience a loss and they just stuff it down. Or they s distract themselves. Or they don't want to talk about it. And so, or they even deny it. And so they have all kinds of ways of avoiding as their go-to. And as a result, they don't resolve that loss. It's hard for people who've never attached in a healthy way to any other human being to be in a relationship where they have some partial attachment and then to lose that relationship it's hard to let go and so grieving a loss of a person is harder for people with complex trauma because they have great difficulty letting go due to their attachment issues and then other things that are triggered when you lose somebody or something, it can trigger feelings of abandonment. It can trigger fear, fear of being alone, fear of my life is changing, what's happening here? Fear of the unknown, what's going to happen next? Fear of not being able to handle the pain that you're going to be going through. And then you can have feelings of hopelessness triggered because you're just so overwhelmed by all the pain or losing somebody can trigger or losing something can trigger worst case scenario thinking okay now everything's terrible now my life is all going to fall apart or it can trigger flashbacks or dreams of other losses it can trigger the fear of being a burden because now you know you're feeling very weak, you need help and support, but you're afraid to ask for it because your fear of being a burden has been triggered. It can trigger shame. Oh, I just lost another person. I just lost another thing in my life 
that proves how terrible I am. It can trigger feeling out of control, and that's a scary thing. It can trigger unrealistic expectations that somehow I should resolve this grief within a week and have a smile on my face again. And, and this is what my grieving should look like, all unrealistic. And so it can set you up to think you're failing and then beat yourself up. Or for some, it triggers their image issues. That what are people going to think of me now if they see me crying all the time? If they see me so needy? All of those things can be triggered. And so that's why grieving for people from complex trauma is something that is very difficult and that's why they're called high risk. Because there's so many other factors that come into play. Okay, having said that, let's go on to the losses due to complex trauma. And I'm just going to read through these 42 quickly. Every child should grow up in an environment where they feel safe. But in complex trauma, you grew up in an environment where you didn't feel safe. So you lost what you never had, which was safety. But that's a painful realization is to realize, I lost safety. I lost the privilege of feeling safe as a child. That can really hurt. Every child grow, in a healthy home grows up with connection, needs connection to the mom and dad, to other significant people. Complex trauma, you didn't grow up with connection, so you lost having healthy connection. You lost feeling understood. Every child should feel totally understood. You didn't get that. Every child should be totally accepted for who they are, warts and all. You weren't totally accepted. That's a loss. Now some of this is going to start to feel heavy for some of you as I go through it. So if you need to take a break, do that. Every child needs unconditional love. You didn't get that. And that's a huge loss. Children, being a child is a time of just being innocent, naive, just enjoying life in a safe environment. When you grow up in complex trauma, especially sexual abuse, you lose your innocence early. And that's a huge loss. Childhood for a child should be time to be curious, to explore. But for complex trauma, you're trying to survive. You don't have time to explore and be curious. That's a huge loss. For a child, they're free to just be a kid, to make mistakes, to learn how to cook and make a mess, to just play and have fun. You didn't get that. And that's a huge loss. A child in a healthy home grows up experiencing forgiveness when they fail. You didn't get forgiveness. You just got that held against you for all of your childhood. You weren't even allowed to fail. Whereas children in a healthy home, they, they learn by failure. But that you didn't have. That was a loss. Child, children need to be respected and treated with respect. You didn't get that. That's a loss. Children need lots of validation about who they are, what they're, what they're good at, that they have value. You didn't get that validation. Children need tons of encouragement because they are going to fail. They are going to make mistakes. They are going to get discouraged. You didn't get that kind of encouragement. That's a loss. Children in a healthy home develop self-respect. You didn't develop self-respect. That's a loss. Children in a healthy home come to a place where their main emotions mainly are contentment. You didn't feel contentment growing up. That wasn't your main emotion. Children in a healthy home, they don't have to be on guard. They can just relax. You weren't allowed to do that. You had to be on guard. You couldn't relax. Children are given tools in a healthy home to handle problems, 
that could be stressful, to handle painful emotions and know how to resolve them. You didn't get any of those tools. And that's a huge loss. Children in a healthy home, they learn to trust and to be trusted. You didn't learn to trust. You didn't trust anybody. That's a huge loss. Many children grow up with just a sense of a spiritual and they in their childlike ways in a safe home connect with God, their higher power. You didn't have any of that. That's a loss. Children have a predominant emotion just happy about stuff. You didn't have happiness. Children are going to get hurt and so their parents respond by nurturing them and comforting them you didn't get nurture and comfort. Children grow up in a healthy home and they gain a sense of identity. This is who I am. You didn't get that. That's a loss. Children are allowed in a healthy home to have dreams about what they want to do. And those dreams seem possible. You didn't dream. That was impossible. You're just trying to survive. Children in a healthy home begin to figure out what their purpose in life is, what they're good at, what their gifts and abilities are. You didn't gain a sense of purpose other than surviving. Children, as they come to the end of their childhood in a healthy home, look back and the predominant thing is good feeling memories. You don't have that. You don't have good feeling memories of your childhood. Every child should have close relationships with parents. That they're first your respected authorities and then they become your friends. You didn't have that. Children need a sense that they are important. You didn't get that. Children need a sense of peace. That even though there's storms out there, things are okay. And they have an internal peace. You didn't get that. Children grow up in a healthy home and they feel this is normal. Now I understand normal. If this is, I understand what healthy is. You didn't get that. You don't understand what is healthy. Because your normal wasn't healthy. Children can just relax. They can just enjoy. You didn't have that privilege to have days of just relaxing and enjoying. Children can learn from mistakes. You weren't able to learn from your mistakes. Children have, in a healthy home, have mainly positive emotions. You didn't get that. You had mainly negative emotions. That's a huge loss. Children have an ability to know what to do with emotions. They're given tools to identify and learn how to manage and express emotions. You didn't get any of that stuff about regulating your emotions and identifying them. Children in a healthy home, they grow up where they experience healthy boundaries because their parents set healthy boundaries for them. You didn't get that. Children in a healthy home... They can set boundaries with their parents, with siblings, and those boundaries are respected. You tried to set boundaries, but nobody respected your boundaries. That's a huge loss. Children in a healthy home, they don't get false guilt put on them. They don't get blamed for stuff that really they didn't do. But you were blamed for all kinds of things that you didn't do and made to feel guilty. Children in a healthy home grow up liking who they are, liking themselves. You grew up not liking yourself, hating yourself. Children in a healthy home learn how to be a good parent when they grow up and want to have kids. You didn't get that taught to you as to how to be a good parent when you grow up. Children in a healthy home they're able to safely talk to their parents about their struggles. You didn't have that safety to talk about your struggles. Children in a healthy home have parents that they can be proud of and want to be like as far as character 
and the use of tools. You're not proud of your parents and you don't want to be like them. You want to be very different from them. Children in a healthy home, they experience healthy play. Many children in complex trauma, their idea of healthy play is teasing somebody, laughing at somebody, practical jokes that are hurtful, and then you laugh at being a bully. You didn't even get taught what healthy play looked like. And then children in a healthy home, they're given time to explore different hobbies and activities and sports to find out what they're good at. You weren't given those opportunities. 42 losses. And again, for some of you, that's going to be a very painful realization. And I just encourage you to follow some of the stuff I'm going to say now. Practical guidelines to help you begin to process through these 42 losses. And you might have had all 42. So number one, understand that there's not... There's no shortcuts to grieving. The only way through grief is you got to go through it. You can't go around it. There's not a shortcut. And you can't hurry it up somehow. And understand that every person grieves differently. So how you're going to grieve is going to be your journey in figuring out what works best for you. So some people need to talk. Others are more quiet. Others express a lot of emotions. Others put more stuff into words or are more internal. Some need more to be alone. Others need people around them more. All kinds of different things that you need to be aware of. But what I would say to you is reach out to somebody. You can't deal with these losses alone. You need to talk to somebody who gets it. So a friend who gets it or a counselor, there's grief support groups, Part of what we do with Lift and React is we have groups where people can talk about these losses. Read books. That can be very helpful in just learning more and more tools. And then as you're in a group, talk about the losses. Be specific. Share memories around some of the stuff that is connected to that loss so that others who share the same loss can identify and, and you realize you're not alone and you can help each other and support each other. Be kind to yourself. As a child, you didn't choose those losses. They were handed to you. So don't get down on yourself. Don't beat yourself up. Don't expect yourself to grieve perfectly and get it over with quickly. Sometimes you're going to need to take a break from grieving. This can get to be too much. So learn your limits. Learn when you need to put it on the back burner for a while and just say, okay, I can't, I need a break. That's okay. Deal with any guilt you might have where you made, were made to feel that the reason you went through not being respected or loved unconditionally was your fault. No, it's not. That's false guilt. Deal with that. And then prepare for some times where you're going to feel very alone and very overwhelmed in this journey of processing these losses. And then there are going to be times when some of these losses are going to get triggered. So when you see a family where people genuinely love and care for each other, that can trigger stuff. Even holidays where you see other families celebrating in Christmas for you was not a happy time. Those can be um, triggering things or birthdays can be triggering things. I will say that for many people in this journey of grieving, a spiritual connection can prove to be very helpful if you want to explore that. So the point I want to make is this. When a person begins to deal with their complex trauma, basically part of that journey is grief. Grief, because you went through so many losses that grief becomes a companion on your journey in healing from trauma. 
A lot of people don't like that. And I wish there was a way I could take that away, but I can't. That's just the reality of recovery. But it's worth it. It gets easier as you go. Now, I want to add one final thing that I hope will help you just take this a little bit further in your thinking. And it's a type of this whole loss thing that comes out of trauma that basically is this. The losses of complex trauma and complex trauma itself result in having a limitation in life. So picture somebody has a car accident and all of a sudden they're paraplegic. They're, they're paralyzed from the waist down. They can't do what they used to do. They can't play sports. They can't do things with their kids. They now have a severe limitation. And for many people in the beginning of dealing with a limitation like that, they go very negative, very depressed. They think their life is ruined now and they see their whole accident and the results of it as nothing but a negative. But over time, many of them come to go, come to a point where they go, you know what? I got to grieve that old life. It was great, but it's not possible anymore. I have to accept that I won't walk again. But that doesn't mean that I can't have a good life. I can learn to live with these limitations and have a good life. And that's the process that I hope you're able to go through. As you begin to deal with your losses, they're going to limit you, yes, but that isn't just a negative thing. You can still have a good life, but you have to accept some of the lim limitations. And so complex trauma results in 10 limitations that I want to give you um, that we have to come to a point where we learn to accept those limitations. So number one is all of my life now has limitations. I can't do necessarily what others can do because it triggers me too much. I can't do some activities that others do. I can't go some places that others go to because of my trauma and the triggers that take place. That's a limitation. And sometimes I can't even do stuff I used to enjoy before the trauma took place. I can't do those things now because they trigger me. That is a hard limitation to accept. But it's the reality. Next is I will go through the stages of grief, not just once, but over and over again for years because that limitation is going to keep showing up over and over again for years. And that is frustrating. I got to grieve this now. I got to grieve this now. Third, life now has many vulnerable areas, many triggers. So I don't just get my trauma triggered in one or two things. I can get it triggered in hundreds of things. Certain people, certain personalities certain looks of people, certain places, certain things, certain activities can trigger me. I can go to anger. I can go to unhealthy relationships or be in an unhealthy relationship, and that's going to screw me up. So I can't do that. If I go to fear, that can take me down hill really quickly. If I have anxiety that I don't get on top of quickly, that can mess me up. Loneliness, boredom, stress, depression, all of those emotions can trigger all kinds of trauma things and old behaviors. Experiencing disrespect. Even I can have trouble with sleep, trouble with money, trouble with envy and resentments towards other people who don't have my problems. And now I got to deal with all these painful emotions that trigger all kinds of things. That is limiting. Four. Now I am forced to deal with stuff I rather wouldn't deal with. My life is not going to be as easy as others. I'm going to have to make hard decisions on a regular basis. I'm going to have to do things I would rather not do. I'm going to have to deal with painful emotions I'd rather not deal with. That's a frustrating limitation. 
Five. There's other ways that life is more difficult. If I'm going to stay on track, I got to get structure, routine, discipline in my life. I have to add extra things to my life that others don't have. I need support meetings. I need to, to take courses and keep learning and keep reminding myself uh, of what I, my reality is. I need to grow up in certain areas and take responsibility for my life to make changes where I, I don't want to be responsible. So life can get a whole lot more difficult if I want to get healthy. And that's a frustrating limitation. And then six, life now requires that I be very vigilant. I can't just walk around and do whatever I feel like because that could really mess me up. I have to be alert to danger. I have to be aware of my emotions, my thinking, my stress level, when I'm vulnerable. All of that is a limitation. And then life now has an element of unpredictability. I can make a commitment that I'm going to go to a certain event, but then earlier that day I can get severely triggered and spiral downhill, and all of a sudden I guess I can't go to that event. And now I feel people can't count on me because I'm not as reliable, but I can't see every possible scenario. I get blindsided by things and they mess me up in a hurry. So for many people with complex trauma, what starts out as a good day can turn to a bad day in a very short period of time. And then number eight, you will feel a lot of guilt. Because you feel like you're letting people down. You can't be to them what you used to be to them. And that is a frustrating limitation. And then you're going to go through times where you just are tired of fighting it all. Tired of the constant struggle, constant war inside your brain. And so part of recovery is the limitation that life will be very difficult. And it's going to wear me out at times. And then, number 10, you have the limitation that others aren't going to accept or understand what you're going through. They think you should take this course and have been fixed by now. They don't understand the length of the process and the messiness of it. People are going to come to you and say, oh, there's this new magic formula, this new quick fix that will fix you. They don't get it. Or people are going to say, oh, you just keep talking about your problems. You're just using it as an excuse. And that's going to hurt. So dealing with losses is a grieving process, but it's an acceptance of limitations as well. Again, I just hope that this helps you. It might feel very overwhelming, but I hope there's some tools here as well that you can take. So that's the end of part one. I'm going to take a short break, and then I'm going to come back with the Christian part. If you're not interested in that, not a problem. You're free to go. No offense taken to everybody else. I'll be back in just a minute. Well, welcome back. We've been going through the life of Joseph in the Bible. And last week we left him where he was in prison. <clears throat> uh, the cupbearer for Pharaoh had promised to talk to Pharaoh when he got released about Joseph's situation so that Joseph could get released. And then the cupbearer forgot all about him. And so for two years, Joseph sat in prison after the cupbearer said he'd get him out. And it was a very dark time for Joseph. So today, I just want to 
summarize kind of what we've seen to now. Joseph is now 30. At age 17 is when his brothers sold him and he became a slave. So for 13 years, Joseph's life has been one trauma event after another. I'm sure there were times in Joseph's life where he just said, is, is it worth it? Why not just off myself like this? It, this is undoable. 13 years of pain, getting my hopes up to have them crop, dashed again. It was very, very difficult. But what Joseph doesn't know is his life is about to turn around in a big way. So let me read to you what happens in Genesis 41. Two full years later, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing on the bank of the Nile River. In his dream, he saw seven fat, healthy cows come up out of the river and begin grazing in the marsh grass. Then he saw seven more cows coming up behind them from the Nile, but these were scrawny and thin. And the scrawny thin cows ate the seven healthy fat cows. At this point in the dream, Pharaoh woke up and realized it was a dream. The next morning, Pharaoh was very disturbed by the dream. So he called for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. And when Pharaoh told them his dreams, not one of them could tell him what they meant. So Pharaoh has this dream. All of his wise men can't give an interpretation. Pharaoh's frustrated. And then we're told at that moment, the cupbearer remembered Joseph. Dreams. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I remember a guy who can interpret dreams. He interpreted my dreams and the, and the baker's dreams. And they happened exactly what they said. And so Pharaoh says, send a messenger and bring this Joseph guy from prison so Joseph is woke, awakened that morning and dragged into Pharaoh's courtroom or his palace room and, and he said, Pharaoh's got a dream. And so Joseph says, God does interpret dreams. He's still hanging on to belief that God is going to keep his dream. And so Pharaoh tells him the dreams about the seven cows, the seven fat cows, followed by the seven skinny cows. And Joseph says, here's the interpretation. You're going to have seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. And then he says, sir, if I could just make a suggestion, I think it would be really smart. If you put somebody over all the grain harvests of the, of the land of Egypt, and in those seven years of plenty, that they would tax the farmers 20% of their grain, which would go into great big grain silos, so that when the seven years of famine come, there'd be enough grain to feed Egypt. When Pharaoh hears that, he goes, wow. Joseph's suggestions were well received by Pharaoh and his officials. Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has revealed the meaning of the dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or wise as you are. You will be in charge of my court and all my people will take orders from you. I also will put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Wow. Wow. Do you realize Joseph's life just turned around? God is about to begin giving to Joseph all the things he promised him 13 years earlier that looked like they would never happen. And so the first thing that Pharaoh says is, I am going to give you a position of great power. People from, you're going to be in charge of all the land, all the grain of the land, all the administration of that. Now, do you think maybe Joseph could look back and say, oh, I learned some administration skills while with Potiphar. 
I learned some administration skills in prison. God's been preparing me so that now I can be an administrator over the whole land. More than that, I rub shoulders with Potiphar government. I rub shoulders with the cupbearer and the baker and the prison keeper government. I learned about the government of Egypt. Now I can step into a position of government. God was part of preparing me for that. And now my dream of people bowing down to me is about to take place. And then Pharaoh says, he removed his signet ring and put it on Joseph's finger. And he dressed him in fine linen clothing and hung a gold chain around his neck. Jo Joseph became an extremely wealthy man. And then he says, Joseph, he had Joseph ride in a chariot reserved for his second in command. And wherever Joseph went, the command was shouted, kneel down. Tremendous respect. And then he's given a new name. And then, which is Zaphonath Panea, which means God speaks and is alive. And then he's given a family, a wife whose name is Athena. One good thing after another, just bang, bang, bang. That must have just left Joseph stunned. And then we're given Joseph's response. It says he was 30 years old when he began serving in the court of Pharaoh. During this time, before the first of the famine years, Two sons were born to Joseph and his wife, Asana. Joseph named his older or first son Manasseh. And in that culture, when you gave a baby a name, you gave him that name because of the meaning of that name. And the meaning of Manasseh is, God has made me forget all my troubles and everyone in my father's family. And then Joseph named his second son Ephraim. For he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my grief. So let me say what I think Joseph is thinking. For thir he said 13 difficult years. And now he sees his dreams coming to pass. And he says, to see God working again and that God has not left me. God is fulfilling his promise. God has been there all the time. I just didn't feel it or see it in my circumstances, but, but I see it happening now. My dream's coming to pass. That helps me forget all the pain. That helps me forget all that bad stuff. Oh, I still remember it, but it's not as painful now. It, it, it's not something I just see from a negative light. I see that it was preparing me. I forget all that pain. And then, fruitful. For 13 years, it looked like my life was a desert. It looked like nothing good was going to ever come out of my life. Now, one good thing after another is coming up. I'm going to save the whole nation of Egypt. I, I'm potentially going to save the world. My life is going to become super fruitful. But I needed 13 years of preparation to create this kind of fruitfulness. I get it now. But I'm going to focus on God's design in all of this was eventually for greater fruitfulness in my life. I think that is such an important part for people with complex trauma or extreme trauma. God isn't saying you're going to have an easy life. God isn't saying I'm going to make you rich and all of that like Joseph. He, he did that with Joseph because he had promised that to Joseph way back. But what God is promising to all of us is if you allow me to be part of your journey of healing, I want to take all that bad stuff that happened and turn it into positives in your life so that you are more fruitful, so that you experience some wonderful things again in your life that will help you forget some of the painfulness of all of that difficult time. That's what I want to do in your life with all of that pain that you've gone through. And Joseph's life just shows that that's what God's about. 
So I hope that will encourage you if you've been struggling with that. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for Joseph. Thank you for your faithfulness, that you keep your promises, even though at times we feel you've forgotten all about us, and that you are all about taking the bad things that have happened to us and turning it into positives and just help people who are struggling right now to be encouraged and to trust you. Amen. Well, that's the end of our...